I don't by any means feel like I'm an expert. I think that we all have different things. So simply the first thing is how, how are we currently using any type of technology, much, much less mobile technology in our classes. And I know you teach music, so you said you would prefer the piano, but do you do anything right now with? Yeah, the piano and the synthesizer. The synthesizer. <laughs> do you do anything with computers or with, with phones uh, or iPads or I, any other tablet I, device? Too, because actually I did my dissertation on CL, uh, computer aided learning. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was like the last century. <laughs> 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 I'm so ancient now. So yeah. um, I have to do some catch up with what's happening with this. Mm -hmm. uh, see, when, when, I, when I was a student, this was non existent yet. Yeah, you know, yeah. computers were like much bigger. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's why I'm here. Yeah. And how about you, Myra? Do you do anything right now? Yeah, um, I actually encourage my graduate students to submit their assignments in multivariate ways. Like, for example, they can do a podcast. Okay. Or they can submit through a blog. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. varied outputs. And I also have uh, an active website, yeah. which I also recommend to my students. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Benji, do you want to talk about any of the ways that you use stuff? Um, because I'm an instructional designer, so I don't really do a lot of teaching. But, uh, some of the key tools that I use are Google Relator, mm -hmm. and uh, use a lot of them actually. Uh, and I also recommend to the staff to, to use Google. Uh, but besides that, I think uh, the other thing that I've been trying to try to use a lot more would be um, stuff like uh, Twitter or social medias to promote teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So CEL is, is right now uh, focusing our effort on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I personally have seen a lot of teachers using mobile phones and how, how are they doing to, it? to use formative assessments. Mm -hmm. So it's just using a handphone to just tap, tap, type in their responses. Yep. Then you can see the screens, what they're saying or thinking. Mm -hmm. So I'm just interested to know what can we do in NIE to help our teachers to pick up some of these skills. Okay. Great, great. Well, um, and that's the, everything you said is stuff that's going on currently. Um, but what I'd like to do first is if you could, uh, if you could get out a piece of paper or your device, whether you want to write or type, whatever you feel most comfortable with, we're going to take about one minute here, and I'd like you to list every single thing that you can do on your device. Okay, whether it's your phone or your an iPad or whatever, list every and not just academic. Okay, so go outside of the academic realm for a minute. List everything that you do on your device. While you all get started with that, I'll keep it quiet for now so you can really think. Okay, so um, why don't everybody give, let's share at least two things that we currently do on our devices. Yep, you gotta, well, I mean, there's, there's a ton, and we may go to more, but let's just start with two. What are two things that you do on your devices? Anybody? I buy tickets. You buy tickets, okay. Good. What else? Yeah, tickets and concert tickets. Mm -hmm. tickets. <laughs> All kinds of tickets. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what else I do? Oh, I download lots of movies and music. Okay, so you download movies and music. Good, good. How about you, Maya? The calendar. Use the calendar feature. Yes. Okay. Yes, because I'm spatially challenged. <laughs> Directionally <laughs> impaired. Right, right, right. GPS, okay. So GPS and the calendar feature. Good. <laughs> Good. How about you, Benji? Um, I think Zachary thinks that I'm like uh, hooked on to Twitter all the time. So <laughs> I, I actually participate in social media most of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, like her, I use the GPS and Google Map quite a lot because uh, I drive. Yeah, mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, that's pretty much about it. Yeah. Okay. And how about you, sir? calling and WhatsApping. Yeah, you can call people, right? You can call and WhatsApp people. Yep. Yep. What I would like you to do is next to each one of those things that you wrote down, think about how you could use that particular feature in class tomorrow with your students. Okay? So we'll take again another minute here and write down every single way that you could use it in class tomorrow. Okay. So um, now what I just did is I demonstrated one way that I use it in class is there's an app that I use as a timer. So anytime I have my groups doing something, okay, I'll put the timer on and what I can do is project this up onto the screen. And so then they can see the time that they have left 
and then at the end you heard the sound. Now there's lots of different timers out there. This is one called Howler Timer, and you can hear it just howled like the moon. Um, but this is a really, really good way to manage class with our devices, and you can get this on your phone, you can get it on the iPad, whatever. Let's go through some of the stuff that you listed, and we're going to start over here with you this time, how, how the things you listed, how you could use them in class. Pictures of students' work. Okay. Posted up on Facebook. Okay, good. So pictures. Yep. WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Share pictures and things. Okay, okay. Good, good. What about Google or Twitter? Um, I, I will usually use a uh, Google Doc for uh, collaborative writing sort of assignments or, or uh, practice in class. And then um, sometime I will use a Google Form uh, to capture survey. Uh, most of my presentation is created using the Google presentation, which is equivalent to PowerPoint. It's just that it's stored online. It's easier for access. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I try to share some of the links on Twitter to people who follow me, so that's another way of using it that I usually use. Okay, good. How about you, Mara? This is something that I haven't really explored or tried yet, but I would like to use it. Evernote. Evernote, okay. I know that it's an app mm -hmm. that you can download on your mobile phone. And I, I think that you can also share some of the documents that you type in. Absolutely. Evernote. Yep, yep. So Mm -hmm. um, another would be BookMine, which I think a lot of the students here at NIE may not be familiar with. It's, a, again, an app where you can check whether the book that you want to borrow from the NIE library is actually mm -hmm. available. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's BookMine. Okay. Um, real quick, and then I'm going to ask you to go beyond apps. You talked about the GPS and the calendar before, so I'd like to, you to think while I'm explaining Evernote how you could use those features in class tomorrow. Okay. So Evernote, for those of you who aren't familiar, Evernote is an app that allows you to either take written notes, verbal notes, pictures, videos, etc. And the nice thing about it then is you can store them all in one document. So for example, if you're studying composers, okay, you can have verbal notes, you can take written notes of composers, you can pull up a piece of their music, you can show a video of a, of a, a symphony playing one of their pieces, and you could pull up a YouTube video that talks about that composer and save it all in one place. So now it's not five separate different documents, it's all in one place. And then you could share that. Um, no, because it does it seamlessly. So it just integrates it seamlessly. So um, Evernote, it, there's a little bit of a learning curve with it, but it's really, really useful. Uh, it can be a really useful tool. I don't use it a lot, but I know a lot of people who love it. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, the, and the reason that we do this exercise to start with is because I think a lot of times we make it too hard. Everything that we automatic, we already do on our devices, we can use in class. So you brought up great use of pictures, right? I mean, our, our kids are snapping pictures all the time, and we all know how to snap a picture on our device we can automatically bring that into class. And here's, what, here's the big thing about mobile devices, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in a second though. It makes the learning more relevant for them. Because now it's not them going and finding an outside image, now it's them taking an image. So when they're sitting in class and you've got, let's say, 25 students and they're all reading different books, then you have them on their GPS go to the setting of the story. And you have them follow the path of the main character if it's a book where they traveled perhaps. Um, you can also use something like Google Lit Trips. I don't know if you've heard of Google Lit Trips. If you can look, you can Google that, Google Lit Trips. And what Google Lit Trips does, Google Lit Trips takes stories and what it does, and this is, it, it's incredible. It takes a lot of the big time stories and what it does is it follows the main character from place to place and using Google Earth, it actually takes you specifically to those settings where it took place at. Now here's the thing, before it moves on to the next place, you have to answer a question about the story. So you can't just follow the journey without reading. You have to know the comprehension question that's asked at each place. Is this an app? No, it's, on, it's online, but, people, you, but you could access it through your mobile device. And you could also have your students make their own. And this is what I think would be very interesting to do with a class, depending on how long the books were, and if you had a character that traveled, is have each of your students make a Google Lit Trip where they use their GPS and they put it into Google, to Google Lit Trips where the, you know, they, they followed each book. 
And if you go to Google Lit Trips, you'll see a, a wide variety of books that have already been made, that they've already done that with, but it's user content created, so teachers can go in and make their own. So again, I, I, what I'm gonna encourage us to do is to think about everything that you do today. There's no magic pill. Anything that you do with your device, we can use in class. And, and so we're gonna talk about just some pretty simple things, including texting, including how we can use images, video, Twitter, um, for lots of reasons. And then at the end, if we have time, we can go through a couple of apps and other things. But, but the thing is, I think a lot of times, especially in higher ed, we're looking for that magic fix because we don't want to try anything new because we've been doing the same thing over and over again, right, for a lot of years. But the, the cool thing about mobile technology is if, if we can just be a little bit creative, we can take almost anything and use it for class or let our students use it for class. And, and I'm sure that you all are familiar with the three R's of teaching the rigor, relevance, and um, relationship put by the Carnegie Foundation. They talk about you know rigor. If, it, if it's not difficult, it's not gonna mean anything to students. So we have to challenge our students. If it's not relevant to them, if they can't see the relevance, why are they, I mean, how many times in math class did you go, when am I ever gonna use this? Right, a lot of times our students will use that. And then the relationship, they have to have some type of relationship to whatever they're teaching. And that's the good thing about mobile technology and allowing our students to use it is we can create those relevant pieces for them. We can create that relationship with the material by simply saying, go find this location. Or instead of us looking at our biology book and figuring out a plant, I want you to go take a picture of what that plant looks like. And that makes it much more relevant and real for them. So um, what happened on June 29th, 2007? Does anyone know? Changed the way that we will teach forever. The introduction of the iPhone. The first generation? First generation. Now what happened in, um, what happened in April 3rd, 2010? Samsung? No. <laughs> the iPad. And here's the thing, uh, and I, I don't just say this to say this for hyperbole, these things are literally changed the way that we do everything in the classroom. Unfortunately, let me rephrase that, it hasn't changed the way that we do everything in the classroom, but it should be. Because for the first time ever now, we have every student has access to a ton of funds of knowledge. And I know that we use that term a lot, funds of knowledge. But before, in the classroom, traditionally it's just been me as the teacher, I'm the only fund of knowledge. And I'm just like an ATM or a cash machine, right? I'm just giving out knowledge and you can take it and suck it in and great for you. But now, now that we have all these devices, we can really access other funds of knowledge, including what our students already know. And that's probably the most important thing and the most powerful thing. Um, so uh, I'm gonna show, I just wanna show you this little five minute video real quick and I'd like you to pay attention to it and I'm gonna ask you at the end of it to, to pull out a couple of things that you find most interesting. Okay, so a um, couple things that you find or found interesting, and I'm going to let that play silently in the background, but what are a couple of things that, you, that really stuck out to you as you watch that? The future belongs to social media. The future belongs to social media. Okay, good, good. What else? This is actually very familiar to me. I use the same video clip, but it's not this. Um, the shift happens. Yep, sure yep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and included a few information for special needs. Right, so right. So made it relevant to our ed studies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we do show that. Yeah, yeah. What about you? Anything stick out at you as you guys watch this? But actually, I didn't, I didn't realize that the impact of social media is so huge. Although, yes, I, I know that it's huge and I've been participating as a avid user in it. But it didn't come across to me that it's just going to be like this huge. Mm -hmm. We can be more connected than ever. And yet the one place a lot of times that we're not connected is the classroom. Mm -hmm. When we know that people learn collaboratively, we know that this is the world that we're preparing them for, right? If we're preparing them for jobs or we're preparing them to be teachers to teach the next generation, but we're, we're not accessing any of these things in our classrooms. Not so much in, in the formal setting, but more in, in the informal setting. Right, in informal settings sometimes, but once we get into classrooms, it's interesting. I was um, watching this with a group of teachers last year. I said, 
So all this stuff is so, it's growing so quickly, and yet our schools outlaw it. Our schools don't allow it. Our teachers don't allow it. So in some ways, our schools are like China. <laughs> and I thought it was a really interesting way to think about it. You know, I, again, that's not, those aren't my words, okay? But I do think it's really interesting that we're preparing a, a, you know, our students for a world that is going to look drastically different than anything that we've ever seen before, and yet we're still preparing them like their education is 20 or 30 years ago before yeah, social media. Uh, in, in schools in, in Singapore, did they allow the students to bring handphones and iPads to school? Yeah. I think it depends on the school. Yeah. 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 Because I know in, in some schools in Malaysia, these are, these are like banned. Mm -hmm. they, they they're not allowed to bring and, and here's the, but remember there's and, and so yes and no it depends I think on the school and the classroom but it's not really about it's not really about whether they're allowed to bring them it's about are, there, are we using them and are we utilizing all the, the power that's in the devices yeah, obviously if they don't allow the students to bring this stuff to school it means they're not using kids right right but even if we do allow them to bring it uh -huh. I mean we allow them to bring it but are we utilizing it for learning and that's the thing that I think that's the next step is now Okay, yeah, I allow, I allow kids to bring their phones, but what are they doing with their phones? Are we using them as learning tools, or are they just tweeting out, hey, what are you doing after school today? Right, and I, so I think that those are, the, those are the big things we have to think about. So what I'd like you to do is using your device, leave a voice memo for yourself about the video you just watched. So pick up your device and see if you can figure out how to, learn, how to use, or to leave a voice memo for yourself. Voice recording? Yeah, for yourself, a voice note for yourself. How are we preparing our students for the 21st century? That's the question I want to answer. And I'm, I want to come back. One of the interesting things about that is you just asked how we're preparing students for the 21st century, right? One of the things on Twitter, one of my colleagues wrote, if we're just preparing students for the 21st century now, we're 13 years too late. And I thought that was a really interesting kind of way to look at it. But now let's talk about this voice memo that we just left. How can we use that in class? Because again, all of our students have devices, and yet are, they, are we just allowing them to bring the devices, or are we actually using them in class? So how can we use this in class, out of class, et cetera, with our students? Things like the voice memo. Okay, for a student with special needs, maybe who has trouble with the physical act of writing. Okay, now they can voice record their, their journal entries or their diary entries. Good, what else? Because you teach music. Could you have your students either sing something and okay. record it or play something and record it, and then they can analyze themselves. They can do self-analysis. Okay, could you have your students, as they got done with the story, give 20 seconds immediate feedback? So they don't have time to think about it. You know what I mean? They read, it, they read a story, boom, immediate feedback. Could we have our students with assessment? This is another form of, you know, the formative assessment. As we go along, you got to leave yourself a voice memo. Now, here's what we do with all those, with all those things, okay? They can self-analyze it, or you can have them send them, and you can post them on your blog. So now they get not only their own feedback, they get everyone else's feedback in the class as well. So now what we can do is create discussion because what you took away from a lesson might be completely different from what you took away. Or when you listen to your song that you sing, you hear something completely different than me as an outsider. I think that that, and I'm using terms that I don't, I don't know, crescendo is perfect. But you might think, no, that was horrible. So something like a voice memo, which is on every device, which is very simple to use, can present huge learning opportunities. The other thing is, let's take it outside of class, okay? Um, this weekend, uh, give me a, something that we might study in class, anything. Well, I mean, to, to counter what you just said, mm -hmm. I would rather have them write than talk. Why? Well, it's easier for them to it's easier for me. Okay, okay, no, 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 yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you for being honest. Then to listen to somebody mumble in, 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 a, in a something like this. Okay. Maybe sometimes the recording may not be too clear. Okay. It's faster to read what they're trying to say. That's interesting because I would... To listen. Does anybody disagree with that? I'm not sure if it's cultural. Because I know... If it's what? If it's cultural. Okay. Because um, I think in most, well, in Southeast Asian countries, mm -hmm. we don't really... Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. even in, you know, when we call someone on the phone, we very rarely make use of that function. Right. And to transfer that, I mean, 
if we compare it to how voice messages are being used, for example, in the United States, when there's an art and science to leaving messages, mm -hmm. <laughs> just to mm -hmm. you know, get people to leave messages to your phone, right. it's not being practiced as much here. So I'm not yeah. sure if it's a cultural mm -hmm. thing. That's why there is a reservation to using audio. And, and that's completely, I understand the reservations. One of the things that I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, let's see if I can find it right now. Um, and I'm just going to give you one example. This is a program called Time to Know. Okay? Time to Know is a reading program developed in the UK. And what it does is as you read, okay, as you read a, a specific story, it asks you comprehension questions. So as you answer those comprehension questions, it adjusts the text to your, to your level of reading. So here's the thing. It can go down to the student who needs a little more support, but it can also raise the bar for the student who's a little bit further along. So, for example, students read on their laptops. Some students were reading the story on their own, and those who chose could have the story read to them. Let's say a student with dyslexia would rather have put the earplones in and have it read to them. The vocabulary was adjusted for students who were more advanced. So some children read that the horse ran. Others read that it galloped. The next student might read that it galloped swiftly. Here's the thing when we talk, there's two things about this. First of all, this can't happen if not every kid is allowed to use a device, right? Because, you know, you can only do this on a device. But second thing, one of the things that we know about students with special needs is that one of the big things around fourth, fifth grade is they don't want to feel different, right? But all of a sudden, if you're reading at a second grade level and you're reading at a fifth grade level, now I, don't, I have to read a whole separate book. So now I'm, I feel very self-conscious about that, which turns me off to reading, which turns me off to learning. So now I can be reading the same story as everyone else, and then as I answer comprehension questions correctly, it will actually increase the language so that it's more effective for me. So you're saying that this is a software that can actually adjust, adjust real time? Yes, yes, it adjusts as, as, you, as the, the comprehension questions are asked. Now, I'm not saying that this is perfect for everything and for everyone, but this is an example of some of the things that we can do to make learning more accessible than it's ever been for students. And again, you take away that social component where I'm not embarrassed now because I'm not reading a different, a different story altogether. It, this started as elementary. Time to Know started as elementary, but now they are actually increasing. I mean, they're constantly increasing the books that they, they offer. But if you go to their website, you can see this is their old screenshot. But now they have all different types of research um, articles that have shown how this has helped improve learning in schools and so on and so forth. So, so are the comprehension questions asked after every chapter? I think it's throughout. So it's throughout. The, the chapters it's asked. You, you're a reading person, so you would understand it more than I do. But um, basically what it does is as you read, it asks you comprehension questions throughout, not just at the end of chapter, not just in a set place. So. It's adaptive in that sense. Exactly. It's very adaptive. So, um, and then here's another example. Okay, so time to know is one. Sound Gecko, what I can actually do on Sound Gecko is I actually can go in and just copy the website into Sound Gecko, and then it will read it to me. So again, you take a student who, learning a foreign language who doesn't read great but can understand spoken language, they can use that. You take a student who has dyslexia, who doesn't read really well but understands everything, it's just the input part is the hard part. Well now, it's, we're making learning much more accessible for those learners. It's, I've actually listened to a couple of things, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. And it's constantly getting better. <laughs> Some of them still do. Some of them still do. Um, but just like anything, I mean, we have a colleague, Ming Yi, who he listens to, if you know, if everyone might know Ming Yi, um, he, he's blind, and so he has to listen to everything read to him. I can't understand a word of what the computer's saying, but he listens to it now enough that it makes sense to him. So just like anything, you know, it, it's, it's adaptable. Um, so what are some of our biggest concerns about using technology in class? Some kids have access to it. Okay, so accessibility, absolutely, yep. It's like plagiarism, copy and paste. Okay, yep, plagiarism, yep. What about others? I think I share your concern, not using it enough. Not using it enough, okay, on the opposite side of that, not, not utilizing it enough, yep. 
One of the, the big things that our students and teachers that I work with, their biggest, there's two things that they're concerned about. One of them we talked about earlier is the students are going to know more than I am. I'm going to look silly, right? Which we have to kind of get over that ourselves a little bit, if, you know what I mean? Because that's going to happen. But the second one is how do I manage the class? So how do I know that Benji's not actually on, you know, <laughs> well, I, she can be on Twitter, but how do I know that she's not shopping for groceries right now? How do I not know that she's not out planning her next vacation, right? So classroom management is a big issue. And so I, I always put these out there at first because this helps sometimes teachers that want to use devices but are terrified of how to use them. And so here's some, here's some just some, some common classroom management tips. Number one, dock your device. Anyone know what dock your device means? It means you have a place on their desk or table or whatever that they have to put their device face down. Now here's why. Okay, because if I'm up front and I want everyone on their devices, et cetera, okay, and it, maybe it's a phone, maybe it's an iPad, I say dock your device. There, for me, it's always the top right-hand corner of their seat, okay? And they just have to put it face down. And here's why. Because if I say put your device away, a lot of our students are so good that they're sitting there, their device is down here, and they're still playing, right? So I want to be able to see their device. So I'm encouraging them to use their devices. I'm encouraging them, and all of a sudden... I want their eyes up on me because I'm going to go over a really important point or something they really need to hear. Dock your device. Device goes down. Now I can see everyone's device. I know that they can focus on me. Does that make sense? So dock your device is one way to kind of help manage your class. The second one is hands up. So play along with me. When I, when I say hands up, put your hands up real quick. One, two, three, hands up. Okay, now hands up. Up, 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 yeah. Now I can walk around and see what you were doing on your devices. You see what I mean? So now I've got a class, and if you have a huge lecture hall, you're probably not going to be able to walk everywhere. But what, if you have a class like this, but if you have a class like this, right, and I say hands up, all of a sudden everybody puts their hands up, and you have to teach them to do it right away, right? Now I can just take a quick little lap. I can see that everyone's doing what they should have been doing, and I can move on with the lesson. So here's the third one, okay? Apples up. Apples up means show me your screen. So show me your screen, Edgy. Apples up. So now, okay, now remember the first one, dock your device, means everyone's working on their devices. I want them to put their device down for a minute and really pay attention to me. These two are everybody's working on their devices, and that's fine. I want you all working on your devices. I just want to check to make sure you're doing what you should be doing. So first one, hands up, boom, I can do a quick walk around. Apples up, you stay seated exactly where you are. You just put your apples up. I can see what's on your screen. Or, or you've done something like on a whiteboard, on one of the whiteboard apps, now you just show me your answer. So I can actually see your answer as you put it up. Does that make sense? So those are a couple. Um, color coding, what I mean by this is if you, if you give out um, assignments that you've created, you change the font color to match what it is. So for example, if it's a homework assignment or something like that, you put all the font might be in green. Okay, if it's a group project, all the fonts in orange. If it's an assessment, all the fonts in blue. So now we're doing a classroom assessment. Everybody's on their device doing an assessment. If I walk around and I see that you've got green pulled up, I know we have a problem because you should only have blue pulled up because that was what the assessment colors were. Does that make sense? So you can color code assignments when you give them out and then that way students and now I don't have to make a big scene. I can just take a lap around class and be looking at everyone's screen from a little bit away and see green, blue, whatever I can check the colors. So those are some really starter tips. Um, and then I always talk to teachers, you know, this is something we all know or we should is just proximity control. You have to get out amongst your class. It's absolutely vital. Um, and then finally, I use peer pressure. And what I mean by that is I'll, you know, I, I say to students, um, if, if I catch one person not using their device appropriately, we all have to put our devices away. Some people would not like that strategy, but what happens? They start policing each other. And that's the best thing that we can do is have them start watching each other. That way I don't have to, just like if after, and this is another one that, it's funny, I've given eight hour presentations in, about technology and given out tons of great things and people will be like, this is the one. 
I'll tell, like, I don't ever, if I do at the end of a, you know, you're doing group work and then you stand, hey, everybody, I'm back up here. Let's get, if, bring it back in, bring it back in, bring it back in. I'll just say shush each other. And they love to shush each other, right? But it's just like this with peer pressure. They, I would much rather them shush each other. I would much rather them watch each other and make sure they're doing what's right than me have to be, because then it becomes me, I'm the bad guy. I don't want to be the bad guy, right? So those are just some um, tips. That you, to think about. So let's talk quickly about texting and polling. Um, this is a question that's asked a lot. Is your smartphone making you stupid? <laughs> I'll be honest, I think it's the wrong question. I don't think it matters. And what I mean by that is even if they are making us stupid, are they going away? Smartphones aren't going anywhere. Just like, and, and this is the example that I always use in Singapore because this is the culture that we have here, is there will be a set of stairs right here, and there will be an elevator right here. And everyone knows that taking the stairs is better for you. And yet people will wait for the elevator for four minutes to go up two flights of stairs when they could have just walked up the stairs that were right next to it. And why do they wait for the elevator? Because it's more convenient. OK. Whatever it may be, right? It's more convenient to wait for the elevator. And whatever your rationale is, is fine. But at the same, it's the same thing with smartphones. They're not going anywhere, and people are going to use them anyway. So whether they're making us stupid or not, what we have to do in education is figure out ways to use them better, to figure out ways to, again, use them as tools for learning. So I think it's really important that we, we try to acknowledge that. And it's funny, if you even go back to the 1800s, uh, Charles Elliott, who was the par president of Harvard, said too many of Harvard's students had bad spelling, incorrectness, as well as an elegance of expression and writing, and ignorance of the simplest rules of punctuation. Every time, we always say this about our students. We always have this attitude about students. We always have this attitude about learning. Oh, well, they're not learning the same things. And, and they, that's, I'm glad you said that. Wait till he sees the SMS, because that's what I'd like to talk about. I'd like to talk about text. <laughs> You know, text speak is, is the kind of the LOL, the, the shaking my head, all those little <laughs> things that we use. Um, a lot of times teachers have a real issue with those. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just a different way of talking. It's just a foreign language. And what we have to do as teachers is help the students understand that there's this type of rule for foreign language and this type of rule for formal language, right? But could you allow on first drafts your students to just use SMS language for a first draft of a paper? What's the point of the first draft, though? Just ideation. I think it's, it's, it's OK to just use symbols or pictures, whatever, to just get ideas there. Yeah, the first draft is just getting the ideas out, right? But so many of our students feel like it has to be perfect the first time that they don't get all the genius out. They just, they're so worried about the grammatical and the spelling and all that, making sure that it's correct because that's the traditionally what we've done, that we don't allow them to get out the really important, the really impressive content. Because there's, there's a big difference, right, between the content and the process. The content and the process are two different things. How it comes in and how it comes out are very, very different than what it actually is. And a lot of times, we're so focused on the process as teachers that we ignore really great content. And if we start, if we allow students to kind of express themselves in ways that they're most comfortable, and are they most comfortable texting? A lot of times, our students are very, very comfortable texting. That's when they really free flow. So if we allow them to express content in this way, first draft only, it can be an interesting way for them to get that content out. And by the way, I understand that there's, there's cultural context here, and this is very difficult to think about. But again, I'm, as someone who really wants to reach every learner, I think it's really important that we stretch these boundaries and that we allow students to express themselves. Because again, this is, and this is one of those terms I use all the time, allow genius. We have to allow genius in our classroom. We know that Einstein couldn't read until he was seven or eight years old until he was seven or eight years old. Thank goodness, because he talks about his early schooling, how bad it was. Thank goodness he had parents that kept allowing him to express his genius in other ways. Because if it would have only been allowed to express it through writing or reading, who knows where he would have ended up. We may never have had Einstein, which is pretty scary to think about. Walt Disney, dyslexic. But he was allowed to express himself through, 
drawings and creations and all those types of things. So again, it's about allowing our students to express themselves in a lot of ways. Okay, what I'd like you to do on your device, um, go to this website real quick, www.vot.rs. And then what you're going to do is enter that code, please. Now it's going to ask you, how comfortable do you feel using mobile technology in class? Do you feel very comfortable or just comfortable on its own? That's all you have to do. Okay. Okay? That's all. So you just answered that question. And what I can do now is I can go in and I'll go down to my questions. But then what it does is it gives me a real-time graph of where they're at. So how can we use things like texting and polling in class? Because you can either do that through some text tools or actually an online tool like Mentimeter, which is what I just used. How could this be valuable in class? I mean, there's a, a thousand ways, right? Before class begins, what are the pre-background pre knowledge? What do they already know about a content? Middle of class, are they learning anything? You could say, you know, we just talked about uh, this particular concept, you know, do you feel very comfortable, a little comfortable, not comfortable at all? What the heck did we talk about? You know what I mean? Give them choices. You could have them do open-ended questions and have them ask the same things. So all these ways are things that we can use that can be really effective for us as we're teaching. Because now, what, like on this one, I was lucky. I looked and I said, okay, well, they're actually getting stuff. But what happens if, if I would have, I've learned and, and the majority of people were over here? Well, then I've got to change the way I'm teaching something, right? I've got to change the way that I'm delivering the lesson at that point. So it's good to, to constantly kind of be thinking about what we need to do differently and how we can do things. All right, let's talk quickly about images, and then I'm going to have a little get up and go challenge yourself in a minute, okay? So let's talk about images. Um, what do you see here? This is spelled wrong correctly. Correct? This is spelled incorrectly. This is on campus. Yeah. This is at a higher education institution in Singapore. They happen all the time. I see them all the time in Singapore. But part of the reason that we don't see them is because we don't have a critical eye, because we haven't been taught to have a critical eye. Look at that tattoo. What's wrong with it? Your. Live you are life. And so the thing about these three examples right here is we can have our students, this is on campus again, we can have our students taking pictures of mistakes that they see out in public. So if it's music, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know your, your content area well enough, but could they, you know, uh, take pictures or take video of things that are wrong when music is described or lyrics, or could you have them go out and find um, uh, lyric sheets that are printed wrong? You do know what I'm saying? Like one of the things that we need to do with images though, is start using them because it makes our students critical thinkers. Because how many of our students walk around like this all the time? On their devices anyway, right? But first thing it does is it takes their eyes up off their devices if we use this and we, and we build it into the assessment piece. But second thing, it makes them actually think about, hold on, that doesn't look right. And it makes them actually see things differently. And so... Exactly. But again, how do we build them off? We put it into the assessment. One of the things that I do with, my, with some of my classes is 10% of their grade is finding mistakes. They have to find mistakes and take pictures of them. It does two things. A, again, it makes them critical thinkers. But B, it also makes them recognize when I, when I spell things wrong, what does it look like? Right? When I, do, when I make mistakes and they go out to the public, that's how silly it looks. Um, this is a whole website that is on math mistakes. People take pictures of math mistakes and send them into this website. So it's a really interesting exercise because again, it gets them to think critically and it gets them to go outside their mind. But as you all know, I mean, this is, if nothing else, images are good for this. Have you all seen this, this scene at all? Uh, in conferences, yes. Yeah. But what's the good thing about allowing students to take notes this way? Because what about, the, again, that student who doesn't write quite as quickly and doesn't get everything down? You know, I, I didn't have great handwriting when I was young. And so I would write down the math formulas. But then I would get home and there was just one little X that I thought was a Y because I hadn't written it clearly enough. And it would throw everything off. 
So if I could have just taken a picture of that and made sure I had the formula correct, it would have been so much easier. <coughs> so again, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to argue everything with you. You just, th these are things that we can use. And these are things that I think we should be using. 10 minutes, I'd like you to take your device, okay, and go outside, anywhere outside the classroom, and take a picture of something that relates to your class. Something, there's some way you could pull that into your class, okay? Go to my students and say, okay, look at the picture, look at the sculpture, and probably come up with a musical idea based on the, based on the type of sculpture. As you know, the arts are always so well, well integrated and connected. Mm -hmm. So many instances where you know, composers look at a piece of art, or a, a picture, or a person, or whatever, and they start to write music based on what they have seen. Right. So uh, probably can use, do the same exercise. Right? I love that. I love both of those examples. And, and could you see your, you know, let's say that even, you, how, I don't know how long your course is, is it a day or a couple hours or maybe it's a semester, you know, whatever, but like during a break. Right now, I just go out and take a picture of something that relates to class. And again, it makes it much more relevant for them. So let's talk about video. And um, we're going to watch this one real quick. This is about just a couple of minutes long. <laughs> You see her trying to move it with her finger like she does on the iPad? Oh, oh. Yeah, she's trying to move it like she would on the iPad. See, she's trying to grab it like she would do on the iPad. Same kid, same kid. See, look, now she checks to see why isn't this working. And what you're going to see here is she actually puts her finger on her leg to make sure that her finger's working. See, look, no, my finger's working. Why isn't this working? She can't figure out why this is so static when she's used to playing with an iPad, which works. And see, watch her again. If we go back and watch the video again, look how engaged she is with this. She's one years old. A magazine is an iPad that does not work. It will remain so for her whole life. Steve Jobs has coded a part of her operating system. And again, this is cute and it's fun, but are we actually thinking about this when we teach and how students learn? Because we are having a whole generation now She's going to be in school in five years. We're preparing teachers to teach that child. And yet, if we don't use technology in our classes and teach them how to teach that child, she's going to come into our class and be completely disengaged. Because all she, she again, a magazine's just a, an iPad that doesn't work to her, right? And that's not the way we think. I love magazines. I love newspapers. I love hard books. But it's a different generation. And I think one of the interesting things about that video is that I can tell you all that, but once you see it, it's incredibly impactful. It's much more impactful. Video is the new text. And we have to start using video all the time in our class. And one of the things that I encourage us to do, and this is another video, is think about how you can use video in your class for assessment, whatever. Speaking of assessment, Perks, have anybody, did anybody read this book, Perks of Being a Wallflower? I have not. I don't know the book. It's, it's pretty famous. There's been movies about it, the whole thing. But apparently, one of the big concepts is infinity. Okay, and, and being infinite. That's one of the huge concepts in the movie. So this teacher, all she said was each of our students in my class, she said all of you have to make a video, one minute long, that shows me what infinity means to you, or what infinite means. So this student made a video of her playing Monopoly with her father. Now if you've ever played, have anybody ever played Monopoly? Monopoly is a game that can go on for hours and hours and hours and hours. And so for this student, her explanation was that Monopoly with playing Monopoly with my family takes forever. That's infinity for me because it feels like it's never going to end. Right? Now, and one of the things that I think is really important to, 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 to talk about here is that with this particular example, as the teacher, as the instructor, do we have to know how to do all the special effects? We don't have to know how she, I mean, she's changing colors, she's got music, she sped things up. We don't have to know how to do any of that. All we have to know about is, does she demonstrate the concept? And for her, 
that's a pretty good demonstration. When you talk about infinity and her talking about, for me, it's infinite when we start playing Monopoly because it's never going to end. It's going to go on forever. That's a good definition of infinity, right? So again, I, one of the things that I also try to do is, is help us with that second kind of feel is that we don't have to know everything. We can give out an assignment and not know everything. All we have to know is make sure that they have demonstrated their understanding of the concept, of the objective, et cetera. So what's one, one concept your students could explain using video? Now, when I say using video, let's talk about the difference between consumption of video or production of video. Because those are two big things that are very different, and we have to make sure that we are having our students not just consume video. Because a lot of teachers use video, but they pull up YouTube clips, which is good. Like what you were saying, it can give you access to music, to, you know what I mean? That's really, really good. But the skills our students need aren't just that piece. They're also producing the video, right? Like that example I just showed you. So this is a big difference between production and consumption. We have to make students aware and give them the tools to produce, not just consume. So what is one concept your students could use, and let's think about your course next week on ethics, explain when they produce video. Okay, so you're going you're gonna to give them an assessment. I want you to produce a video about this particular concept. What could they do for your class? I want to explain the concept of fair assessment through some everyday scene that they can capture. Okay, maybe explain the concept of fair assessment. And see, and, and this, is the, this is the big key here, okay? Don't feel like you have to give them too much. If one of your key ideas that you talk about in class is fair assessment, they, and, and they might go watch, uh, you know, their, their little brother play a sport and film that and then talk about fair assessment and that. They might go watch an interaction or, but do you know what I mean? Like, make them come up with, with how they're going to do it because that's where the thinking occurs and the creativity. And, and I know from the MOE, creativity is a big push right now, right? And that's where the production comes in, not just the consumption. Consumption is more the same. Production is when the creativity comes in. What's the concept that you could use and have your students? In music, they are basically just three opposing sides. That is high, low, loud, soft, and fast, low. OK. So with using this opposing uh, axis, you can actually yeah. go and take pictures of nature or whatever, or what is high versus low, what is loud versus soft, and what is uh, fast versus slow. Mm -hmm. so, I love that. I love that. So again, these are really good examples, and, and there's a ton more in music, there's a ton more in assessment, there's a ton more in anything, but allow our students to use them. Um, this is, uh, I love this video, and I think this is the year in review, 2012, from Google. Google puts this together. They, they, they combine all their data on the most search terms, and they put it together at the end of the year. But we could do this in class, too. Uh, if you allow your students to take pictures, if you allow your students to take video throughout, at the end of the class, have them summarize their entire class, set it to music, and then here's the great thing about that. Now they walk away always having a reminder of that class. Because, I mean, there are so many images up there that we all remember. Right, but to go back to them is a whole new place. And so I, again, I encourage us to use video all the time in class. And I allow students to video anything and everything that they want. And then that way, they can use it at the end, they can use it at the beginning, but then at the end of class, we always do a class review. So what I'm gonna ask you to do real quick is I'm gonna ask each of you to exchange devices. Okay, so you give your device here, you give your device there, Bidji, you give your device there or vice versa. And what I'd like you to do is film each other, okay? Giving three takeaways so far. You have 30 seconds to do it, okay? Okay, the three takeaway one is that uh, magazine is an uh, iPad that's not working. That's something that I've not heard before. Um, secondly, it is uh, video is a new text. Um, last but not least, I think the, the part about the Google search trends seems to be something that caught my eye. So I was searching on my iPad what uh, the search trend may be right now and, and this is what came up. So I thought maybe this is something cool to show. 
So this is the current trend that is going on in the US and all the different words that you see appearing are actually the, the trending words that people are searching right now. Okay, that's it. I just found out, learned that um, I have to do more social media in Ligma. And, um, and believe it or not, it just, just come to me that uh, my students are going to teach uh, babies, young children who grew up with iPads. And so they need to know how to use iPads. So I need to have access to iPads. It's going to be a problem, especially in a country it's not so economically well off, and not everybody can afford that. So I'm going to try to see how I could encourage my students to use videos and sounds to express what they know in speech in class, in assessment. And I'm going to try to find out what this time to know is about that seems very interesting. It's this adaptive um, learning that has implication on assessment. I think that I want to find out about that. And also to support my interest, some get to some very interesting too, so I want to find out about that too. Thank you. How could you use that little exercise in class? Why could that little exercise filming each other in class? Because again, we're talking about mobile devices and how our students can use them. I mean, we can use our own, but our students can also use them. So how do we use that in class? For me, it's very good. It's self-analysis, um, especially if you're talking about performance, sportsmen, musicians, dancers, you know. Perfect. You need to, yeah. you need to be able to look at yourself. Because when you're actually playing or singing, you can't really analyze yourself. Yep. You have to do it when you're not actively involved with the eye of performance. Mm -hmm. then, you, then you can start analyzing. Perfect. Good, good, good. I, I think uh, usually when we tell the students to go back and reflect on what you have learned, uh, they generally will not do it, or if they do it, they cannot really remember what they caught on the spot. Mm -hmm. So um, doing something like that is helpful, but uh, bringing the technology, I think bringing something that is new and novel, they kind of like, um, well, some of us will enjoy it, some of us will find that, hey, we are scared of the camera, but the pressure kind of adds some uh, uh, interesting element to, to the whole exercise. Mm -hmm. How about you? I think we do this exercise mainly through pen and paper. And I think by videoing, you are giving that multi-dimensional feel to the whole experience of reflection. Mm -hmm. And that your learning can be expressed in your facial expression, the way you talk. And so when you, re when you, when you bring that back two more three, three days later, you, you, you remember more distinctly how you feel. Mm -hmm. yeah. You remember. I think that's more powerful than just running through the Thank you. And I, I think you bring up really good points, all of you, different ways to do it. Um, one of the things I want to address with yours is that we, are, we do get nervous in front of a camera, right? Especially the first couple of times. And you, you said, uh, you know, the so, but here's the thing. What did that make you also do mentally? Actually put down something in concrete that you had learned, right? Instead of walking away going, yeah, I, I learned a lot of things. Well, what were those things? And then all of a sudden, we, you know, we go out to dinner and we hang out with our friends or our family and all those things just kind of became, eh. But when we actually have to, to put it into concrete words, now it becomes much more specific. So I would bet that tonight, three hours from now, if you were to say, hey, what'd you do today? Oh, you went to a workshop. Well, what are a couple things you learned? You're going to remember those much more concretely now than, you know what I mean, if not. So this is, a, this is an exercise I do with my class. What I actually do, because you know, if, if accessibility is an issue, I actually have my device and I stand right by the door. And as they walk out, everyone has to tell me one thing that they learned from class that day. Okay? So you're going to see what this actually looks like. What did you learn today? <laughs> Fun. These are my students in my class. These are teachers in training? Yep. Okay. Pretty well. Good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now, but what you can see here, and what they're saying is, you know, not the important part. Now, what, here's the key thing about video, though. What can I do with that now? Archive it. Archive it. For whose future reference? Yeah, so now I can go up and put it on a blog, put it on a website, share it with them through email, whatever. 
And now they all have all of these different takeaways from class, not just their own. And it also can be a sort of feedback for, for the instructor. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know about you all. I've taught things before where I thought I taught it really, really well. And then they walk out, and I'm like, that, they didn't get at all what I was trying to teach, right? <laughs> So it's not only feedback for us, it's feedback for them. And, and like you said, and one of the things is, you know, when you see yourself and what you were wearing and your facial expressions and how nervous you were, that brings a whole different element to learning as opposed to just writing something down. Not that writing is bad. I have my students also put their takeaways on Google Docs. So they have this and they have a written takeaway on Google Doc every time. So again, just another way that we can use mobile devices very, very simply, right? But we're going to take a real quick quiz, okay? It's only, I'm going to have you watch this, okay? It's a one minute, it's only one minute. At the end of it, I'm going to ask you to, to three questions, okay? I just need you, you can take notes if you want, okay? Um, I just need you to, at the end of the video, uh, answer these three questions. You watch 37 seconds. Now, are you ready for the quiz? Okay, when did our executive need to be in New York? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> where, did, uh, where did Don get the, the deal done? In the res restaurant? No. The no, but uh, the third question we'll ask about the board. What did the board all have in common? Same bald guy. <laughs> okay, same bald guy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the reason that I show this, is for a couple of reasons, okay? When all we do is lecture, for a kid with the processing disorder, that's what it sounds like to him. Doesn't mean if I, now how, what could I do differently with this? I could slow it down, I could replay it, I could give you the transcription. There's all these other ways that I could make your learning more accessible. But oftentimes, we stand up and we lecture and we talk, and that's all we do. For a kid with the processing disorder, that's what he hears. Not because he can't understand the material. You all could understand the material fine if I just slow it down, right? But for a kid with the processing disorder, that is what he hears. So that's the first point, to get away from just lecturing and to use video. Because what's the great thing about video? When I video my class, what can I do? I can pause. I can watch it. I can repeat little sections of it, or I can repeat the whole thing as many times as possible. So I encourage us to use video a lot. The second thing about this is the only question that you actually got correct, okay, was the one about the board, right? They all look like the same person. Why did you get that one correct? Right, because it was visual. And this is a real, again, this is really, really important for our learners because let's go back to that one-year-old playing with the magazine. How is she gonna be programmed to grow up? Everything for her is visual. And so if our students aren't engaged visually through video, things like that, if our students aren't interacting with the material, they're lost. This is what I was talking about earlier. What we have to do is realize that it's not about me. It's not about my teaching. It's always about their learning. And so if I've got a different style of learner coming into my class, I have to adjust. And there's no question this generation of learners is familiar with all this. Do we have to know how to video and put in special effects? No. Do we have to know how to take a great picture and, you know, and do all the colors and all that stuff that our students do with it? No. But what we can do is say, go take a picture of this concept. I know the concept. You know how to take the picture. Right? Take a voice memo as a reflection on your way out. Because now, when you, when you write it, Maybe I get it, maybe I don't. But when I take a voice memo, I can hear my voice and I can hear if there's passion or boredom or whatever it may be as I walk out. And then I can take all those voice memos, I can take all those videos, put them up on, in, a, in a blog or on the screen, and now I'm learning from something that you took away which was completely different than what I took away. I'm learning from your perspective which is the same thing I took away but we took away in different perspectives, how we would use it differently. 
So now it changes the way we can do everything. And we are going to talk about Twitter real quickly. The fastest growing demographic on Twitter is 55 to 64 year olds. Um, first of all, and I think the, there's a, a couple of really big reasons, is A, because in business, like what we saw in the, the social media video before, 55 to 6 year olds are a lot of times leading companies that, you know what I mean, they're at the point in the, their careers where they're in top positions and they understand how important Twitter is to their business. But the second point, and this is the one that I hope we'll focus on, is the fact that it's the best place to go for professional development, especially in education. It's the absolute best place to go for professional development and education. Um, did you know that now a lot of companies are hiring not even looking at resumes? They look at a person's Twitter account. And they'll judge it because what they understand as a business, what I understand now is it's the message that has to get out. It's how I communicate the message. So if I'm a really effective communicator in 140 characters, which is what Twitter is, it's only 140 characters. If I'm a really effective communicator, then I can probably be a really effective communicator about a company. But a resume is not going to tell me that. What Twitter, the Twitter will. Um, some students are being taught to use Twitter as, as early as primary and grade ones. And again, these are the students that our kids are going to be teaching. So we've got to teach them how to use these things properly. Um, I love the, a couple of these quotes. Introduce as many colleagues as possible to Twitter. Professional development doesn't get much better. I was massively skeptical. How on earth could a social network be of benefit professionally since I've started this whole Twitter and blogging activity? I have rapidly, or since I've, I have rapidly become converted to the benefits, discovering ideas, generating enthusiasm, organizing ideas, sharing ideas across schools and across countries. Basically writing this blog and being on Twitter is making me better at my job. Well, here's the thing. You can join Twitter and never send a message. You would receive messages. And what you do is you look for certain people that send things out that are appeal to you. So here's a couple other ones, but I love this one last one. If you're not on Twitter, you're dead. And, and, and what she meant by this is that if you're not on Twitter, you're not developing. You're, you're dead professionally because you've just stopped trying to get better at what you do. And so um, I would usually right now have you go in and create a Twitter account. What I'll do is I'll, I'll give you some hashtags to know. And, and the way that ha you're familiar with hashtags, uh, hashtags, what you do is you go in and you search for these hashtags. Okay, so which, and a hashtag is just that little number sign, right? And then like hashtag higher ed is all about higher ed. All different types. Of, so it's basically a discussion all about higher ed. These are all academic hashtags here. Okay, so what you can do is follow these hashtags and then go in and you know, ed studies. This one is for educational studies and academic papers. So this is a whole discussion about educational studies and academic papers. But this is really important because what you can do now is you join Twitter, you follow these discussions all about academics. And here's the thing, you know who you know, the big people in music are right now. I wouldn't know that. But if they have Twitter accounts, what you can do is go in, follow those people or follow those discussions, and all of their information that they send out will come right to your device. So you don't have to go and search a website anymore. You don't have to go and search and do research on a person, especially if they're a living person. It can all come directly to you. So I know that there's music chats out there about specific genres, is about, you know, uh, about specific compositions. I know that there's Elm on Ethics and what, like, I know that there's a site, um, I'm 99% sure, there's a site that gives out an ethical dilemma every day. Like, that'd be perfect for your class, right? Or for, or, you know what I mean, to follow. So go in, find the people that you want to follow, and then just follow them. You don't ever have to tweet out anything yourself. And I think that's the biggest advantage, is you can just follow and it all comes directly right to you. So. Um, what we were going to do is we're going to do this little exercise where you have to search for people in your field real quick. So I'm not going to do that right now, but I encourage you, I encourage you to think about it. Um, here's some ways to use Twitter in class. Have your students join Twitter and then send out a prompt. So when you come to class tomorrow, okay, I want you to give me three facts about Johann Bach. Right? 
and you can send it out via Twitter. You don't have to worry about email. You don't have to worry about your learning management system. No offense to any learning management system people. But you don't have to worry about all that. It's free. You send it out. Make sure your students follow you if you wanted to do this, to go this far with it. Um, journaling. A lot, of, a lot of classes will, like I have a, a specific hashtag that I use for my class. So then all the students will send their reflections in and it will start a conversation about whatever we talked about in class that day via Twitter. Um, let's see. How do you condense a main point into 140 characters? That's a really, really valuable lesson for our students to learn because again, a lot of, especially we talk about the business world, their, their idea of marketing is how can I hit someone quick and how can I get the message out to them quick? So being able to condense an idea into 140 characters is difficult, but really a good thing to, to have our students do, to try to do. Um, reach out to public figures. I know especially in elections and things like that, people, they'll send out tweets and try to get people to come, the, the candidates to come and talk to their groups. Um, but you could also do it with you know, uh, musicians or, or, or whatever. Um, what would Einstein have tweeted about the theory of relativity? So it can be a place to imagine. It can be a place to think about things in a different way, right? Um, a headline for a historic event. What would the tweet be about a famous piece of work of music now? Yeah, but like, like a, a kind of a seminal, huge piece. What would someone tweet about the review of, I don't know. <laughs> Right, yeah, so, you know, if there was a big ethical scandal, what's the tweet say when you're talking about some of those throughout history or throughout, you know, give them a scenario and they have to tweet what they would say about it. Um, okay, so, and you can see I even created a hashtag here that we were going to use today, NIE staff sharing, but we won't do it Did now. you say hashtag is just like another forum, right? It's just a number sign. A forum? A special forum? Yeah, and then that, and it creates a discussion. So what happens is everyone in here would know that that is our hashtag. And so then we would just search and we could, see, we could have the discussion continue to go. Here's the last thing I'll say about classroom management. If we make the work interesting for our students, discipline will take care of itself. And so again, going back to that, well, I don't know how they're going to use the technology and I'm not sure that they're going to be using it appropriately and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we make the work interesting, we don't have to worry about those things. And part of the way that we can make the work interesting is engage them with the devices that they already want to use in class. Because I, I think it's absolutely imperative. I mean, we're losing this generation of kids already. We know that from the data. If we don't change the way we teach, we're in big, big trouble moving forward. That's just my estimation.